It's a brewing question. Let's talk about it. All right, guys, again, welcome back to another episode of Bain's Basics. Now, we had this question, uh, Paul's to read from GTEC. And again, guys, please put your name in, put the country of origin in, because we're really starting to build a community and we're getting some really, really good questions. And I'd love to uh, address them a little bit more personally, uh, call, you, call you out and say thanks for the question, because this is a, a really, really good question. It gets down to the fundamentals, the difference between uh, custom intakes versus um, mass produced intakes. And the question was, if you didn't read it, was why do we do um, floor mounted, sharp edge, 70 degree um, radiuses generally? I don't, not all our stuff is like that, but um, most of it is always floor driven versus what we see in other popular manifolds with um, a, a bell on the floor or a full bell. Um, and, and, and it's a it's a great question, and it comes down to basically the simple answer is this sort of stuff is designed for average. This sort of stuff is designed purpose built. So we purpose build every single intake. It's for a specific engine combo, and we went through this with the big block build series. So we went into the mathematics. We went into the cylinder head. The, the cubic capacity, our RPM targets, and then we built the intake around it. And we showed that even over what the US guys see on an average of 40 horsepower, we made an extra 72. No flow benches, no nothing, pure mathematics. So we, we, we know the math works and the math I use every top cylinder head and manifold guy is using if they understand it. But the difference comes into what are they doing a manifold for? When you get a billet manifold, they're not designing it for the specific camshaft, specific comp, specific cubes. I will get it out properly. Um, they're designing it for good averages. And the, 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 the best way to look at this is like compression ratio. You can build a street strip engine at 11 and a half to one. You, and then you can build that same motor in a drag application at 12, 13 and a half to one. A little bit more camshaft, obviously dynamics changing, but it's about how close we're getting to the threshold of pain. And, and intakes are no different, right? So they do these very big and very wide for an, a, a wide range of velocity targets. So. And that obviously comes at a cost of horsepower, but it will work, it will run. The difference between it, it working at 85% and it working at 99%. We're, we're building intakes to work at that 99%. I want to extract the most horsepower um, for my customers, hence why we custom make them for you know some of the fastest NAs uh, in the country. For that reason, because we can optimize it. This this is safe. It's like converters. Now, back when we used to do a lot of uh, street combos and stuff like that, I was putting 485200 converters in, and people were like, Jake, that, that's huge. We just run a, a 3500 converter. Well, the 3500 converter is safe, but the 5200 converter is three to four tenths faster, straight up. And, and that's because we're optimizing the converter to the camshaft. I know what foot pounds my engines were making from dyno data. And there were a street combo that I'd put together, a street strip, a 11 second street strip combo, just a five liter way back, like late nineties, early 2000s. So I knew, I knew the spec. So we could dial that converter in so much better for the engine and it could drive on the street. It could cruise along the highway at 2200, no problem because the converter was built right. So it's about how tight you want to make the window. It's the same as engine clearances. You can build an engine and most reconditioners and, and, and street guys will just build an engine loose because loose is safe. But as you start to close the clearance up, you're getting closer to that point of pain. And I've done this for years. Um, I, I've run engines down near one thousandth, uh, so one thousand uh, and even nine tenths. My Lotus motor, uh, which we got a record for 20 years ago, that was eight tenths on the main. So 
but th there's a compromise there. So loose is, is bigger and faster, but it also eats bearings out faster. You're also increasing the bearing load dramatically. Uh, and you see this with pro stock. This is why guys are on super tight clearances and super thin oil now, pretty much all through uh, motorsport. So Indy, F1, all of them, right? They're on 020s and stuff like that. And, and I think uh, Formula One's down near 0.6 of a thou, so six tenths of a thou, which is it's so tight. Hence why they need uh, warmers to actually get heat into the block a and block materials play into this and everything as well. Um, so it comes down to how close you want to get to that, that threshold of pain. And, and with intakes, we're trying to push them and extract as much as we can out of them. And we're, we're, we're targeting both mechanisms. So we need to understand what the radius does, and it has two functions. The first is obviously to control that vena contractor. If we just flow a parallel pipe, we'll actually choke that, and our dynamic width or dynamic CSA is 25 to 30% smaller if we just pull it over a straight edge. And you'll see this on a flow bench if you flow a cylinder head um, uh, without any any radius or any plasticine uh, and then you put plasticine on it yeah you watch the the pressure drop drop and the cfm go up and, and that's because we're fixing this issue the vena contractor the separation that will be created and the as we increase velocity the tighter this gets so we might only lose 25 percent at 300 feet per second but we might lose 45 percent at 700 feet per second so it, 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 it's a sliding scale. It gets worse because, again, this is inertia. I talk about this all the time, inertia, 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 um, because the airspeed is what controls inertia. You understand this in a race car. The faster we go through that corner in a, in a, in a, in a, in a circuit car, the further we end up out on the other side, right? Uh, obviously, the key is the longest radius we can make through that, stay wide, cut into the apex on the far side, right? And end up on the far line. That's because we can carry more speed and a manifold is no different. So as we increase this air speed here, it's gonna, the inertia is gonna make it wanna come closer to the center. So this is the idea of a radius is to target the radius to your air speed. And this is what we also see, like, um, we're starting to see it now in really, really smart guys that are doing billet manifolds and stuff like that. They're, they're far smaller now in the radius. Like the early days of five, eight, an inch were just absolutely crazy. You're getting guys now that are targeting it properly, like Plasma Man and a few other guys uh, that I talk to, and they're, they're down near uh, eight and 10 millimeters. So like that um, five sixteenths to three eight radius, like really starting to use that radius because now they understand what the radius's job is, and that, that's that two functions, our wave tuning and this vena contractor. We're just trying to stop the separation. That's its only job. So naturally, if we look at a radius, and I'll just get a pen for a second. If we look at any radius in a manifold, and you go, well, it's controlling airspeed. So straight away, we can go, well, anything out here is meaningless. Because well, what's this controlling? It's not controlling anything. The, the radius or the turn starts here, from this point to this point. So anything beyond that is useless. So that makes this now dead space. And this is why we delete it. And then we go one step further. I've said to myself for, for years, how do we improve that snap? How do we improve the harmonics of it. So our airspeed and velocity and our supercharge inertia mechanism that, that fills that cylinder is one aspect. The other aspect is our wave tuning. So our quarter wave, which we talked about in one of our first series, actually mixed the quarter and um, third harmonic up, I think, in that video. But um, So we've got our quarter wave, which is when our valve is shut, and then we've got our third harmonic, which is when our valve is closing, right? And then there's Hem Hoyts and a few others, but they're, they're our main two. We want to optimize those. And they're what snaps off this line. Remember I talked about in other videos in our induction series, the more mass we put up in here, the more 
molecular interaction we have. That, that, that volume, the entire volume interacts with the waves because waves travel through particles. They vibrate each particle and the next particle sends that vibration into the other particle and so on and so on. That's how we get this dense vein coming to the valve seat. And we, we, if we target that denseness vein right and get it pushed in right as the valve shuts and, and vice versa, pushed in right as the valve opens, we increase the pressure differential and help the uh, scavenging of the cylinder, evacuation, getting that exhaust gas out. High pressure, low pressure, fills it out, pushes it out, right? Um, so my, my, my idea was always to optimize that wave function and control the separation. So if I know what my airspeed target is here at say 200 feet per second, then at, at you know, on the bench and relative to my math, then I know what size radius I need before I need to break it. And, I, and I'm keeping only the amount of volume in the runner that I need and only the size of the radius that I need. Because again, if we put a massive radius, and I covered this in um, Professor Blair's study and, and what that study missed with, uh, because it showed elliptical bells being the best but that's only in simulation that's not in real world and that's 100 he's 100 percent right there and he even admitted that um the limitations of of what he was talking about and we'll see this on a flow bench the, the bigger you make that port and the bigger you make the bell the better it flows because it's one way it's steady state we're not taking into account wave action we're not taking into account that this is a bi-directional uh, vent we have air going up and down it. And this is the other drama that comes into texture when we use biased texture, which a few people have played with over the years. It flows great one way, but it doesn't flow great the other, and it starts to affect other mechanisms. So it really comes down to how, how, how close you want to get to that line. And be, because all of our engines or all of our manifolds and even our engines that we build manifolds for, we have all the data, we can push to that threshold. We can get 99% out of it every single time. And, and, that's, and, and we've shown it. And that's the difference where if I'm designing a manifold, which I'm helping a couple of companies now in Europe and uh, America, when I'm designing a manifold, I will design something like this and just, just work on the averages. So something that's gonna work better than OEM, but something that's not gonna put that engine in a world of pain. Because remember, if the airspeed is too fast, we're gonna start shearing off here. And then we're leading into that Vena contractor mechanism. And then the engine will just sign off. It'll, it'll just hit a cliff and fall off the wall. And you'll, you'll see that. And some early tests I did in the 90s and early 2000s with manifolds, I was leaving welds in there and I, I was playing with all sorts of stuff and, and, and I'd see it on the dyno. So I'd pull the manifold off, port it, change the radius, and obviously taking some data, taking some math, working out how much, how much of my, say, this, say this is your angle and this is where your radius starts, what that distance is, and we've talked about that before, the transitional length of the radius, and what that area change is relevant to the, the throat of the, the bell, the end of where the bell starts and the, where the angle of the taper starts. So these are all aspects we have to look at. And, and, and I noticed it straight away that we could tune it, tune it, tune it, and start RPM, start RPMing, and then I'd start to lose average numbers. So these are all things we have to look at. And hopefully that clears it up because it was a really, really good question. And, and I get it from a few people and you'll see that more specific um, manifolds that are targeted. So Fast does it with their um, three different runners. They, they, they've they got more of a sharper edge because they're, they're targeting a specific engine with a specific range, an RPM range. So they're able to dial them in a little bit better. We see it in um, sprint cars and some other series, even F1, that what they'll do is come up and then really tight radius rather than have a sharp edge because sharp edge can also lead to 
degradation and fatigue, especially if it's an open edge. So if you just turn it over faster, so like with ITBs and stuff like that, you'll see this. Uh, it's quite quite a common deal. But anyway, hopefully that clears it up. Really, really good question. Remember, pop your names in where you're from, guys, so I can give you a shout out. Cheers.